Hi, my name is Deval Patel. I'm with Dr. Edgar Rodriguez at IOMS, Institute for Orthoplastics and Microneurosurgery, Lower Extremity Surgery and Research. This is a podcast about frame design for tibial lengthening, lower extremity orthoplastics, and neuromodulation. This is a first of series of podcasts that will be released on this channel on subjects including orthoplastics, microneurosurgery, and external fixation concepts of lower extremity. Tibial lengthening, osteoplastic, reconstruction, uh, and, uh, and nerve stimulation, neurostimulation, and that um, Patel had gracefully put this together with the uh, help of uh, Lauren <clears throat> and Kyle. And uh, I think that this is a great, great topic because there's so many flaws that happen when frame assembly that sometimes we just don't don't see why or we don't understand the reason why possibly we get some problems with wire placement. <clears throat> and the uh, if you see the diagrams, is the, the key point is always a wire on top and a wire below. And you tension these wires at 130, and if you put two wires on the same side of the frame, by definition, the, the initial wire is going to drop in tension. So if it was 130, it's going to drop to 110, okay? And something that is sometimes is not... We don't think about it because we're getting in cases and the uh, we 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 don't put too much attention to the wire placement, but it's so important that wire uh, placement is done adequately. And the, the diagrams that we have in this presentation are crucial to understand if you have a wire uh, uh, on top and one below, and you put a second one on the uh, on the same side, then that one will basically <clears throat> will increase the the, uh, the tension of the one below, and then it, it could it obviously it could uh, it could snap. Wires above one thirty they can snap. Wires that are under one thirty they're loose, and these are the things that you have to keep in mind. The message is that he, a wire in the top. A wire below. If you need an additional fixation because the biomechanical demands of the specific patient that you're treating is high, someone that is significantly overweight, a morbidly obesity, of course, you know, then perhaps ideal way for fixation we assembling another ring and then another wire top and bottom on that ring segment or drop a half pin to that ring that has the wire on top and below. Does that make sense? Is If the angles are less than 60 degrees, mm -hmm. you definitely need to, it will benefit that you have basic sequential tensioning. Why? So you don't create any frame deformation. That's really the answer. Mm -hmm. if, if, if the wire angle is less than 45, 45 and less, what happens is that then you will have basically a lot of instability, medial mm -hmm. shadow, and how you're going to control that with placing opposing olive wire. So that the, you, you always aim for 60 degrees. That's mm -hmm. really the aiming, 60 degrees. And if the angle is less than 45, you're, it's mandatory to put opposing olive wires mm -hmm. to decrease the instability of the bone segment within the frame. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Perfect. So from today on, wire on top and below at 130, angles at 160. If we look at the frame construct, the top is, a, is basically a four ring system. The first block from proximal to distal, lengthen the middle is going to compress or it could also stabilize the extremity at that level and the the other uh the the bottom part is basically to stabilize the foot or it could be a compression in that area this frame construct allows you to do anything that you need when it comes to a soft tissue and and uh, soft tissue and osseous reconstruction. So 
it, it has an orthoplastic, basically, uh, perspective. Very well published. And next time yeah, you have a case that requires compression of a segment because you're doing an acute shortening and you need to restore the length, mm -hmm. well, this is the frame construct that you have to build. And it's always the same construct. It's always a four ring system with the option that you can lengthen the proximal component of it and also the, the, the hexapod component could be also placed on the second block between the second and third ring if that's the area where you're going to be lengthening. You can compress proximally and then in the middle ring it could be then your distraction uh, uh, mode. Okay. Okay. So the landmarks, the anterior tibial crest, of course, the distal fibula. So anterior tibial crest, that's where you're going to place the proximal ring. Distal fibula, there's going to be a wire in that level. Okay. And it's very, very important that you keep these parameters because the, the foot support should be a centimeter below the distal ring. That will ensure you that you have a wire on top and below. Uh, at the level of the calcaneus and the, the, the foot, always remember two components, the hind foot and the forefoot, and both need two point of fixation. Every single segment needs two point of fixation for adequate stability. The frame, these are just three, three uh, pictures in which it shows basically the frame construct, the foot support, and if you can always remember the location that you place these threaded rods, you can pre-assemble mm -hmm. these uh, type of uh, fixators and very, very well. So very important, the oxogonal to be oxogonal to the leg, important the tibial tuberosity and the medial border of the tibia, so you know that it's oxogonal. The first ring aligned to the tibial tuberosity, second ring should be aligned to the medial tibial crest, the foot should be in the center of the frame. Why? So then we don't we don't have no various of values. And the tibial crest with the foot alignment in the second inner space. And if you follow these, will be very simple. If you want to have an idea, the frame total length, and you want to pass that information to the external fixator representative, measure the distance in centimeters between the tibial tuberosity and the fibular tip. Mm -hmm. And that will give you an idea, the total length of the fixator. That's a kind of like a, a rough idea where you, how you can use to some degree pre-assemble some of the fixators. Mm -hmm. And you can see it on this case in, uh, in, the, in the frame, how you will have the first ring at the tibial tuberosity both wires they're going to be entering the, the the first wire entering the anterior compartment the second one is below and that will be tibial fibular okay very mm -hmm. very important and then when you move to the distal ring they the same thing mm -hmm. one the one on top is in the anterior compartment the one below is tibial fibular so that's really the most important thing and the angle is 60 degrees angle. There's a template. All of them should be lined up. And you can see the distance on the foot support, the wires at 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, if you do a, a, a wire fixation on the talus, it basically, if you want to prevent some of the, the anterior and posterior translation of the that could happen in ankle fusion. Perhaps just two wires to fix the talus will be fine, but don't forget those will be at 45 degrees. They will be basically at the neck of the talus. And it's very important that you do that in order to prevent any plantar flexion when you are, uh, or dorsiflex when you tension them. Very, very, those are just things that could really make a big difference mm -hmm. when it comes to overall alignment of the extremities. When it comes to the half pins, if I'm lengthening proximally, 
the middle ring is the one it's gonna have the drop half pin and the elevated half pin and those half pins are not perfectly perpendicular to the axis but 10 degrees angulated to the osseous segment mm -hmm. in that way they will have better purchase more stability and always away from the uh lengthening site okay Okay. If I don't see enough bone regenerate, and I will discuss that later, then I will remove the half pins, but those half pins are not the primary fixation area, it's just for additional stability. Mm -hmm. The component that you see in the ring that I'm using my cursor is the dynamizer. The dynamizer is used once you obtain the length that you want, the desired length, then the proximal, that proximal segment will have the lengtheners are removed and the dynamizers will uh, basically encourage bone uh, remodeling and also bone formation. Doc, uh, after the lengthening is done, do you switch out the, uh, the hex struts with the long threaded rods that goes from distal all the way from distal ring to proximal? So yes, yeah, so you you have one dynamizer, mm -hmm. then you have another one in the medial side and another one in the lateral side, and all of them are gonna be connected with a thread rod, and then the struts are removed. Okay. Okay. The only thing that is missing on this picture is your foot wires that will be two at sixty degrees on the calcaneus mm -hmm. and two wires on the midfoot. Got it. <clears throat> I think that when it comes to equinox correction, that's when in those struts they're gonna be extremely long at the in the anterior component and the of the frame assembly and mm -hmm. short in the in the posterior aspect. What what you have to keep in mind that the ones on on anteriorly are gonna be compressing, in other words, shortening and the one posteriorly will be lengthening and getting longer. So what you could do when you have these struts, you can just basically switch the ones uh, from the front to the back. And, and in that way, you can have adequate length on the uh, device. Mm -hmm. When you're doing lengthenings, how could we prevent the uh, how could we prevent basically an equinus? So there's a couple of ways. And I think that this one here, I sometimes I use it. It all depends from patient selection. Someone that is severely osteopenic, I will prefer to put this, the foot support, of course, at the level of the calcaneus, and that will give me the uh, maintain the ankle. So to prevent any uh, subluxation of the ankle and also to prevent any quietness at the ankle joint. And I think that we have a and video here you can listen to it. For an orthoplastic standpoint, how to manage soft tissue and bone defect. If you have a bone defect in this area, this area will compress. The bone defect with soft tissue envelope, it will compress at this level. And then you restore the length on the proximal segment. If we look carefully, we have the lengthening components we have four threader rods on this block for AP and medial line stability. And then on the foot support, we have the struts anteriorly that allows you plenty of space for wires and additional components. And in the posterior aspect, we have two threader rods, so there's enough uh, stability. On the superior portion, you can have the posterior aspect of the ring open to allow for the circumference of the calf. Let's click on that one, and then you guys can see that. Okay, so the same frame, orthoplastic perspective for proximal lengthening, compression at this level for a diaphyseal uh, defect. It could be soft tissue and bone. Compress, restore length. If there's a soft tissue and bone defect, this, seg this segment will compress, restore length proximally. But this is the feature that I wanna show the component. This is a dynamizer. So once you obtain the length that is desired, have this component attached to your fixator at this position, at 12 o'clock, five and seven. 
okay? So we continue this way so you can see it. And then it gets fed by a threaded rod into it. And what you can see, you can set the amount of dynamization at this level. It could be set to the desired amount of dynamization that is required. The, in this frame, I have always removed the struts, mm -hmm. the lengthening strut, and then I keep the dynamizers. I think that the, you will have more micro motion if you, if you remove them. But don't forget that you have to have three dynamizers mm -hmm. to have adequate stability. Three thread but minimum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you look carefully, the alignment, 12 o'clock, five and seven, mm -hmm. while this segment between the second and third ring will be basically at 12, six, nine and three, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's always the same. Always, always, always the same. And then two bars in the posteriorly the, at the foot support and two anteriorly. Mm -hmm. We discussed the octagonal to the leg, how to put the uh, the uh, the ring, the length of the correction, any correction that is needed for uh, rotation also, how to correct various and values. <clears throat> And I think the soft tissue release, it, it becomes very important in cases in which the deforming force is part of, you can basically do some selective lengthening, will accelerate the amount and also decrease some of the likelihood of recurrence. Mm -hmm. The corticotomy technique, the fixator, of course, is placed first, the level of steotomy under the fluoroscopy, and definitely you wanna start from a lateral approach, your press down to bone, second incision, the level posterior aspect to the medial border. And osteotomes, I prefer them in high risk patients, less trauma to the area, less bone necrosis. Although in the healthy patient, the giggly is significantly easier and fast, and the fibula with an osteotome. So tibia is basically a corticotomy on the, uh, on the uh, fibula will be basically our uh, and osteotomy. I think the dressing protocol is so important, very, very important. So I don't touch the frame for at least 10 days. I like to spray with alcohol and change to four by four, cover the frame with the stocking head, the OR stocking head, the six inch stocking head is what I usually use. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to infection, I think that I always gonna be looking if the wire is loose, that's gonna create irritation if it's loose, it had to be retention. Then I ask the patient to stand up. If they stand up and there's no pain in that wire, that's pretty much the treatment. But if I see that the wire is basically loose, I tension it. Mm -hmm. It's still painful. But I see that the x-rays, there's no uh, osteolysis on the x-rays. Just skin irritation, not bone irritation. Then I will say just three to four days of antibiotic. Mm -hmm. But if I see that there's an osteolysis on the wire, then I will say that no matter if you tension the wire, the wire will lose stability in the bone segment. It will be still painful. Then that wire has to be removed. And for the most part, I just use either an elevator or a drop half pin distal mm -hmm. to that point. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the wire cutting. When you cut the wire, do you cut them flush to the to the bolt, or do you uh, twist it so you can retension it later easier? Or if you cut it with close to the bolt, how do you retension it uh, if you have to? <clears throat> exactly. So the uh, I think the the it all depends on the frame as a frame type that you're using. Mm -hmm. The fixation bolt is the serrated the the wire will be embedded into the uh into the ring mm -hmm. so then what i do i basically tension the wire by rotating the wire around the bolt okay mm -hmm. uh, you you'll be surprised is I, I don't see that that often i really really be very mm -hmm. very careful on on having those wires really tight. So no matter when you when you tension, you wanna be sure that that nut is really, really, really tight, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you feel necessary, 
you can use the wire, you can just curl the wire mm -hmm. slightly, so you can have additional wire, but then prevent to place that wire through the hole of the fixation bolt. Mm -hmm. Because when you turn the bolt and you have put that wire through the uh, hole in the center instead of in the groove, mm -hmm. you may just break your wire accidentally. I see, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the lengthening, I think that this is uh, very important. The lengthening time, how do you tell the patient? So basically latency time means with the time between your osteotomy and you start distracting, then you have the distraction it is the lengthening uh, time. And then the lengthening, I think that it will be then a, it basically the distraction. Then you have basically, we need to change this word to consolidation time, okay? Consolidation. Mm -hmm. So latency, distraction, and, and consolidation. Mm -hmm. So one centimeter of lengthening is basically one more, okay? So you have the, then you add the days of latency, which in this case you so well described if he's a patient is healthy seven days in a high risk is two weeks in uh the distraction time on the healthy patients 0.75 but in the high risk i will go to 0.5 millimeter a day okay mm -hmm. and i have to say if if i don't see in four weeks from the time that we stop the uh we stop the distraction okay Mm -hmm. I don't see anything happening on the cloud, okay? I will have to tell you that I will I will basically uh, start looking into what's really going on with my lengthening site, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's basically 0.75, you split that in three times in uh, mid more in morning, then around 1, 2 p.m., and then you know, in the right before bedtime, and they had to take their medication 20 minutes before they're gonna start doing the distraction. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, Doc, you were saying, I remember you saying at class that uh, uh, one millimeter per day is kind of uh, outdated. Uh, oh, yes. It only, I think, on the pediatric literature, perhaps pediatric health individual, but even in the pediatric with the bone density problems, mm -hmm. blounts, and um, only in the high arterial area, perhaps one millimeter a day. Mm -hmm. But I think on the adults and in the uh, high risk, the uh, point, the one millimeter a day is not anymore what is the standard of care. I think that even in the proximal area, if you're gonna lengthen in that area and the soft tissue damage, there was soft tissue damage mm -hmm. in that area, you will consider that also high risk in in uh, to some degree. Mm. And it will be then 0.75, not one millimeter. Okay. Okay. And in the healthy patient, distal lengthenings in a diaphyseal metaphyseal junction mm -hmm. or diaphyseal or purely metaphyseal distal. It will be 0.5 also. I will not do uh, 0.75, okay? Mm -hmm. And Doc, if um, during your corticotomy, uh, if you develop a butterfly fragment on the posterior side, um, uh, for some reason, like not sharp osteotome or any that's type most, of... That's, a, that's really the most, the most common reason. If you don't have a really sharp osteotome mm -hmm. and you don't pre-drill, which I rarely pre-drill the tibia before I use the osteotome. Mm -hmm. I use the osteotome as the primary way to do the uh, corticotomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're gonna have a fracture extension, okay, mm -hmm. which basically is 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 uh, stabilized within that frame. Um, I don't do any changes to my frame assembly. Mm -hmm. unless I see that there may be uh, the extension is too proximal to my proximal wires let's say that that happens then i would just drop a wire to that level mm -hmm. but then going back to the wire tensioning effect then that wire will be tensioned to to 90 like okay. 130 okay? Got it. okay because if i drop that wire and i tension to 130 the wire that is in that same level that i threw that additional wire 
-hmm. it's going to lose the tension and the wire that is on top is going to increase in tension. Mm -hmm. So then the one on top could snap and the one below with the wire that I drop will be basically loose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So keep, keep that in mind, the effect of wire tensioning. Very, very important. Got it. <laughs> be sure that you you stabilize the ankle when you performing the lengthening, you will prevent the uh, ankle equinus to happen. Be sure that you have the knee extended when you place your wires through the gastrosoleus complex to prevent any subluxation posteriorly of the tibia on the uh, on the uh, on the knee joint. Okay, that that could really lead to what to a pain of the anterior crucial ligaments and so mm -hmm. forth. Okay. Yeah. Very very important. Okay. <clears throat> Let's continue here. The complications with circular fixators, I think that there are a lot of them could be prevented if we uh, are very careful with our placement. But the true complication with circular fixator is when you have to abort to some degree the treatment with the fixator and you have to really change treatment plans. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really the most important part. If you look at the picture in the top, the proximal ring is slightly a uh, posteriorly decline and is and it had been placed just in the superior border of the tibial tuberosity, and that's to prevent an anterior uh, translation of the tibia uh, during the process of lengthening. But if you place the fi the fixator slightly underneath at the tibial tuberosity, uh, I think it would be a lot easier. Mm. And you can just prevent some of that uh, additional, uh, prevent that additional translation that may happen, okay? I see. And uh, Doc, you were saying that you still would place that proximal ring, even if you're placing it in fear to tibial tuberosity, you would still place it at an incline, posterior, a little bit posterior incline? No, I don't. I don't. No, okay. If it's below the tibial tuberosity, it's not a problem. Okay. It still gives you enough... Uh, enough uh, clearance for your tibial osteotomy. Okay, okay. got it. Um, and then, of course, so then a five degrees superiorly inclined, depending if, you know, if you follow this diagram, mm -hmm. and then five degrees of really of bear. So it's, uh, you know, uh, medially uh, inclined and then laterally declined. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Got it. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense, Doc. Okay. Then this flap, the posterior fibular septum flap, I consider this flap very very useful when you have to use external fixator combined with the flap. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes skin and dermis during for the entire pedicle and the tip. <clears throat> you can do fenestrations of it, which is what I recommend in, in the patient high risk to prevent this the dermal component to uh, necrose, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a, a flap that the fascia is extremely important that you maintain the entire dissection linearly from proximal to distal to maintain the mm -hmm. adequate flow to the pedicle and the, the thickness of the pedicle should never be less than three centimeters. Keep that in mind. All pedicle, of fascia cutaneous flap should be more than three centimeter. 2.5, sometimes maybe depending on the thickness of the face the, of the of that area or mm -hmm. the the local anatomical consideration. But the thicker it is, the better chance has not just so much for the arterial flow, but it's really for the venous um, venous output mm -hmm. outflow of that area. And Doc, do you pie cross the flap right when in the, doing the first procedure, or do you do it after if I you think see? That I, I'm advising that more and more. I use the FLIR camera mm -hmm. uh, at all times, and if I see that there's uh, some congestion of that skin area in which I can see on the flap, I will pie cross immediately. Okay, got it. Okay, you can see how you can basically, with the frame, you can remove the struts in the proximal segment 
and allow you to basically raise the flap and it's a skin dermis all the way to the fascia. Mm. And then the entire frame can be maintained in place and it can still do the compression of this area if it's needed, okay? Mm. The flap could be also rotated for a, dia a diaphyseal defect. It's a very powerful flap when you have to combine and uh, combine osseous and soft tissue defect and you don't want to perform a shortening of the affected area. Mm -hmm. okay. And the use of uh, vascular uh, towel clamps, mm -hmm. very beneficial to, you know, get some approximation of the skin uh, a, be, a, prior to your suture placement. Okay, yeah. Okay, it makes, I yeah. think that that would be very, very beneficial, you mm -hmm. know. So on the frame, let's see what else do we have here. Frame stabilization frame. Perhaps for a patient that has a heel ulceration, so no wires in the uh, in the hind foot area, just in the forefoot. Two transosseous wire, which they both have opposing all these wires. The angle, the wire angle is close to 60 degrees, so it's very well. And the horseshoe, or Close in the back, that will be offloading. Plus, also, it gives you the option that then you can access to this area for management of the uh, of any type of flap done in the lateral compartment. It could be also a chronic brevis flap, adipofascial flap on the septum. It could be a tibialis anterior, give you access also to back therapy if it's done this well. Then the proximal ring. One wire in the top, one wire below, both at 60 degrees, both wires on the tibia entering in the anterior compartment. The tibial tuber also is at this level, and the center of the ring should be at this level. And basically, two struts posteriorly to stabilize the, 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 uh, the foot leg with the posterior aspect, and this central part to stabilizing the front. In that word, that would be a valid stabilization. Does that make sense? Any any question from that? No, no, that was uh, that was perfect. Yeah, I think that this is just great because then you have the toothpick. How how I put this frame? They should not be complicated. This is a very simple frame apparatus that it need to be mm -hmm. more often when you stabilize soft tissue defects and flap stabilization. And this is something that you will see more, com done, uh, more commonly done in orthoplastic surgeons. Plastic surgeons per se will be very hesitant to put a circular fixator. Maybe some, maybe a uh, pin to bar. I have seen some plastic surgeons in the European community, mm -hmm. but in the uh, American community, they will rely on orthopedic uh, service for uh, or or our service for the circular fixation mm -hmm. or the skeletal type of stabilization. The, when it comes to the flap design, okay, and mapping of the flap is based on per, on the uh, dermal uh, perforators, not on the angiogram. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Simple. Yeah. Everybody should have <clears throat> in our program should have a Doppler. Mm -hmm. and a blur camera, a thermal imaging camera. Yeah. Right. There are, uh, there are, you can both get those on eBay and Amazon, and it should be something that you should always have in your pocket. Yeah, floor camera is about uh, 200 bucks, and uh, uh, Doppler you can get cheaper on, on eBay. Yeah, cheaper. You can, uh, less expensive for $120. Mm -hmm. or get a Doppler. Be sure that it's at least a 10 10 hertz uh, Doppler mm -hmm. probe, okay? Got it. Okay. I like muscle to cover the joint, capsule, you know, any osteostructure. Mm -hmm. When it's to cover uh, tendons and fascia, then I start looking into more like a fascia cutaneous flux, okay? Mm -hmm. Gotcha, thank you. So then with the uh, neuromodulation, it's a big topic, the bioinastem router. You, be sure that there's some, there's some videos, I think, that you can also obtain on the YouTube 
Yeah. 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 I like to consider these in patients that are, they're not, they don't have a reconstructable area poor soft tissue envelope or the reconstruction itself. Don't, I don't think that I'm going to be able to provide the patient with significant relief. So in those cases, I like to do two in-office blocks. They have to be a guided ultrasound. 40 minutes, these patients stay in the clinic. And these are basically to deal with patients that have an aroma formation, but they do have to have some kind of axonal potential for traveling of the impulse that the stem router is going to uh, provide. So it's very, very important that you do these two blocks and the patient can give you some reduction of pain. The literature tells you about 50% reduction in pain. I see that consistently. Mm -hmm. They could be used tibial and peroneal. They can, you, can plug, you can apply one over the tibial distribution and the peroneal. Dark and, if you don't, and if you don't have a, access to it, contact your bioness. Uh, stem router representative in the area, and we can do uh, maybe uh, in a more detailed presentation on placement. And yeah. it's a very simple uh, device to apply, and it could provide you with significant relief of your symptoms. Okay. For your office trials, Doc, uh, the two blocks, uh, do you use a uh, lidocaine, I assume? And uh, where do you? Let's say for in case of tarsal tunnel, where would you do them? Or, or... I would do them the area where you're going to be placing it, proximal to the area that proximal. is compromised, so the uh, distal tibia, proximal mm -hmm. to the flexor retinaculum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you always want to think about you're going to do the block just proximal to the area above the suspected damaged nerve segment mm -hmm. that is less painful. Got it. So okay. you start palpating the tibial nerve distribution, medial, medial ankle, and then distal tibia, all of a sudden you have about five centimeters above the level of the ankle. It's not painful, but distal to that five centimeter is painful. That's mm. what I will do the block. Okay. Got it. Very important. <clears throat> the tips and pearls about how to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then this is a picture that for a uh, superficial peroneal nerve proximity to it. So the in this level, in this particular case, the nerve is suprafascia or subcutaneously, and the nerve is identified, and then the lead is placed just adjacent to it. Very, very, very simple uh, thing to do. Very, very mm. simple. And like I said, it can provide you with significant relief of your symptoms in patients that are that are compromised. Will it have to be removed at a future date, doc, or no? No, patient actually. Sometimes the device could be scar uh, and fibrosis and lose some effectiveness. So that's that's uh, in patients that when that they have a severely compromised area, you you that's one of the reasons why you want to be significantly above an area that is normal is healthy and you can prevent some of these adhesions that could happen but no the device is not removed okay hey when it comes to the inching technique this could be the tibial nerve imagine that this is really the tibial nerve and this is the test that uh, my partner performed so when you have someone that you suspect that they have a tarsal tunnel in other uh, syndrome, which means compression at the tarsal tunnel, okay, tibial nerve compressed in that precise area, the flexor retinaculum. Don't limit the nerve study to that area. So you just always advise the neurophysiologist okay. to test five centimeters above the ankle through the flexor retinaculum and just distal to the retinaculum. So in that way, you can have a wider area in and that you can rule out compression of the tibial nerve. I think that this is very, very important that, that we, we keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. And then in that way, we can provide more, more options to, you know, to, the, uh, to the, our patient, which is really the main point of it. Yeah.